So uh, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Sowell from the University of Southern California. Okay, so I'm not Jay, but I'm glad I get to, to go first because I'm showing a couple of slides from uh, some of his work. <laughs> so the top one, it goes, okay. So we are going to go back to this big, big uh, level of looking at the brain and development. So between the years, it's a construction site. We all know that. It's like the no kidding kind of uh, research finding. So anyway, I'm just going to be talking about some, again, big level um, ideas in human imaging that relate to these changes that we, I will admit right up front, have no idea what really the cellular uh, uh, signal is that's giving rise to changes that we see in structural magnetic resonance imaging. But as the talk you just saw, we're making a lot of inferences in trying to bridge that gap. So what's going on in there? Genes, hormones, experience? Oops, the other way. So the idea here the, the, sort of the big picture that I like to talk about in these studies is that the brain sacrifices plasticity for the sake of efficiency, right? So you have way more connections and, and, and um, neurons than you need, and it's economics in the brain, really. Um, and here's my analogy. The 405 freeway in Los Angeles, which is the most heavily trafficked piece of highway in the country, and I used to have to drive it every single day when I was still at UCLA. Thank God I don't have to anymore. <laughs> That's one good thing about USC, among many others. Is this a pointer? Yeah. OK. I can't see what I'm pointing at. Ah. OK. So anyway, this stretch of the 405 is just notoriously horrible, OK, traffic. Um, but you have limited resources in, in, in the environment, OK? So with the era of uh, money came out, they decided to put a huge amount of money into making this stretch of road wider and more efficient. Well, I really had some shortcuts when I used to have to go to UCLA every day. And so I took a road through um, Bel Air, which I'm sure the residents didn't really appreciate, uh, commuter traffic through their expensive neighborhood. But there was a problem with that road because it was very narrow. You had to dodge around cars. There were potholes, that sort of thing. But you know, when you're younger and you have a lot of different options, it makes sense to keep those options open. But you can't do it forever because there's a limited amount of resources in, in your body and it takes energy to support synapses that aren't really being um, used very much. So it really makes a lot of sense. So we've known for a long time, a lot of studies have shown that there are dramatic changes that go on in the brain in, in signal and gray matter. In fact, I was saying earlier that <clears throat> my PhD mentor, Terry Jernigan, was the first to publish a paper that connected Hutton Locker, or, or conceptually connected Hutton Locker's work on synaptic pruning and typical uh, human brain development because she showed that relative to overall brain volume, kids actually had more gray matter in their brains than adults. So clearly we started thinking back, that was 1990, thinking, wow, maybe what we're seeing in there is that there's pruning of synapses that result in what looks like thinner cortex when you get um, older. But one important thing that we've learned is that really there is a sort of caudal to rostral um, trajectory of development where the sort of primary um, cortices of the brain develop earlier and you have this more extended uh, pattern of development in regions of the brain that are responsible for higher cognitive functions. So again, what I want to do is use this um, heuristic really about efficiency and plasticity. So the idea is that um, with increase, uh, when you thin cortex, you're increasing your, your um, efficiency, right? So you're getting white matter, you're losing connections that you're not really needing to support anymore, but at the same time, you're losing that plasticity that you had when you're younger. So thinning, wait, thinning cortex, you're losing plastic, plasticity, but you're gaining efficiency. And again, there's so much going on in there. It's not just 
age itself and what a lot of our work focuses on, what factors in the environment, what biological factors are um, giving rise to these changes. Also, this is also further support for that notion that the thinner your cortex gets, the more efficient you can be, because again, you've myelinated those efficient connections, but the less plasticity you have, because you no longer have access to those connections that you had when you were um, younger. The ones that you pruned away, you can't use anymore. So this is just um, some kind of boring stuff, looking at change in vocabulary over time in kids studied longitudinally. Um, and it's just really how many words did they learn over the two-year interscan interval. And what this slide shows is that the kids who learned more words between those two, time, uh, uh, two years between scans actually learned more words. So the thinner their cortex got over time within individuals where it's pink and purple up there, the, the more they learned over time. So again, this is just some pretty um, vague suggestion that thinning is actually becoming, becoming more efficient. But of course, we know it depends on where you look and when. But yes, changes in brain structure are related to changes in cognitive function. So this is some of um, Philip Shaw Jay's work. And again, I like to use this to show the idea about how maybe, um, so this work, really amazing um, work, shows that kids who are super bright have a different trajectory of change than kids who are just average. And the difference in the trajectories are these kids here in blue are super, super bright, right? So they keep gaining cortical thickness um, much later than the kids who are just, just average. So the idea here that I think might be going on is that the really bright kids have this extended period of plasticity during which they have time to develop connections that might ultimately be useful. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. It's just an idea that we're working with. And we've applied this concept to kids with different neurodevelopmental disorders um, as well. And to, it, not applying the concept, but using this as sort of a way to think through what's going on. So more of Jay's work. Um, so and it, and it goes back to some of the earlier work we were talking about. Boys and girls are, are different. Their brains are really different. Um, so Jay, we've known for a long time, this is some of Jay's uh, work from Nature Neuroscience, that this peak is different in girls and boys. Well, why? Obviously, puberty, maybe. Could be. It's a good, good first place to start. So um, how do you get a handle on this? So um, in a resource-rich world, you would take 100 boys and 100 girls at every single age during that span of puberty. But resources are limited, right? And so then you say, well, I'll just take 100 boys and 100 girls at one age, since you have enough money to do that. But then what if you get the wrong age? What if it's happening later? Or what if it's happening earlier? And also, how do you know which age to study boys and girls? So I have been collaborating with Ron Dahl. Um, so I say the Ron Dahl part of we came up with this idea. Well, given that resources are not unlimited, let's try to get an age range where we know they're peripubertal, right? There's a lot of dramatic change. We know that. Let's recruit kids across this age range and then have um, that offset that we know really, or really well that boys definitely, there's a two-year average difference in pubertal onset. So this made a lot of sense. So um, I'm going to be talking about, so again, this was data that was collected when Ron was still here. Um, and we've been analyzing it over the years with him, that they're the structural data. So this is work that Jen Brayman did when we were still at UCLA. Um, and really, the basic story, this was the cross-sectional look at the data. And what we're really seeing is when you look at hormonal measures like testosterone or physical sexual maturity, um, boys really are doing something very different, even when they're matched on sexual maturity. So the story here was, while in boys, amygdala volume was going up, it was actually going not changing in girls, right? So that's the medial, um, you know, emotion center of the brain. You all know what the amygdala is. But the opposite was true for cortex. So the girls were actually going down, losing more gray matter than boys, 
okay? When you look at, so the, so the idea is that the girls are maturing faster cortically and than the boys, and the boys have this more extended period of plasticity if we believe that sort of heuristic that I've been going with. Um, so that maybe they have less executive or cortical control over those regions than girls when they're at the same developmental level. Uh, this is also cross-sectional data where we're looking at cortical, um, cortical thickness differences. And what you can see here is the, sort of the same story that um, girls are actually losing uh, gray matter volume while boys are going up a little bit. And there are significant um, sex by testosterone interactions in predicting what's going on in the brain. Now this is independent of age, so we've controlled statistically for age and the boys and girls are matched on physical sexual maturity. So the idea that makes me think about this is that boys, so the girls' frontal lobes are thinning uh, more rapidly and if we believe that means they're becoming more efficient and the boys don't have that same control over the limbic regions and here when we look at the whole cortex we also see boys are still getting thicker here in the limbic cortices and in the primary visual cortex. So the idea is that girls and boys at the same age are put into the same exact environments, right? So when you're uh, 14, you go into the ninth grade, I think. They all, they're all going through these transitions at the same period of time um, during development, but maybe they don't have the same sort of brain age um, boys and girls don't have the same sort of brain age. So an idea that I've been thinking about is that, well, maybe girls are becoming more efficient earlier, gaining control over those limbic regions during a period of time when they haven't had enough time to experience more um, effective coping mechanisms, for example. So you think about girls ruminating and worried about body image and that sort of thing, um, whereas boys are doing these externalizing things because they don't have the frontal control. So just an idea that maybe these dif sex differences in psychiatric um, conditions have something to do with the rate of development of these regions that differ between boys and girls. So now the picture gets, um, so, so, you know, we know now that gonadal hormones have an impact on physical um, brain maturity in sexually dimorphic ways. So I just kind of talked about this concept, but again, maybe girls are sacrificing some of that plasticity before they've had experiences in their environment that would allow them to come up with more efficient coping mechanisms. But what about change within individuals? So I remember, um, so these are data that I'm gonna admit freely are very early in the process of figuring out the, the, the story. So bear with me, and this is work that Megan Herding has been spending her life trying to figure out. It's, it's complex. So again, with, with Ron's um, uh, data collection plan, you know, having boys and girls offset by age, and this, this is the two-year longitudinal data. So first we decided to look at sex by time interactions. You see they're pretty clearly here, where girls, of course, have less overall gray matter than boys, but they're declining more rapidly in gray matter than boys. So there's a, or a trend level significant um, sex by age interaction. And it's different in white matter, boys are gaining a little bit faster than girls. So here we haven't even talked about sex hormones yet. So the same thing when you look at subcortical structures, there are definitely um, sex by time interactions. Different things are happening at different rates and important regions are in the amygdala, and in this study we looked at just overall cortical volume again. So there are these sex by time interactions. Now is where it gets really fun. Um, so when you look at time by sex by pubertal status interactions, you start to see some really um, interesting things that we're trying to interpret. So if you look at total gray matter volume, um, you see in girls that regardless of what level of sexual maturity they are, that they're at, they're losing gray matter during this period of time to cortical volume, right? Becoming more efficient, potentially getting more white matter. Boys, though, on the other hand, are doing different things. They're not losing gray matter as fast. We kind of already knew that from the cross-sectional studies. I mean, these cross-sectional and longitudinal 
data don't necessarily have to tell you the same thing, but in this case, it's pretty similar to what we saw cross-sectionally. But the amygdala is doing something completely different. You have this big um, age by testosterone, by sex interaction, whereas you see boys who are uh, less, have, have lower testosterone levels, are still going up in the amygdala, where boys who have higher levels of t testosterone are going down, right? So you have a definite, uh, within the boys, an interaction between hormone level and amygdala volume. And in the girls, you don't have quite as much of that. So this is complicated. Um, and I'm going to make it even more confusing for you, just so you can see where I am in, in my head with it. So um, I'm trying to be funny. I hope it's working. Because we're not giving up, right? This is, this is very complex, but we're not giving up. So you know, we've known for a long time here, I'm showing some of Jay's graphs again, that we do have these peaks. At some point, that inverted U shape tur tur you know, turns back down. And what? We have no idea. I mean, why? Wind? Why? I mean, we th I think we've thought it, it happens around puberty. Maybe it has something to do with puberty. But you can see in this case, just again, in boys, low, you know, low um, testosterone, it, they're going up. When they're uh, high testosterone, they're going down. So maybe that change in hormones is a flips a switch. You know, maybe it's kind of, it's not just all or nothing, but you decelerate change once you get to a certain level of pubertal hormone. These are just ideas that we're thinking about. It doesn't work in every brain region, though. And I didn't even talk about it, but in girls, um, when you look at estradiol, totally different story in the amygdala, right? So these are the same kids, and presumably estradiol and testosterone are co correlated to some extent, right? They're all going up across this period of time. But it's predicting something totally different in the same brain region than testosterone does. So again, um, it's... We're, get, we're, we're starting to learn. So I think the take home from this, the hormone part, the pubertal hormone part, is that there are definitely relationships and that it, it, they vary by sex. They're very different between boys and girls and at different time periods, right? So we all know that most of the animal studies out there, the vast majority look at only males. Um, so that could be a problem in helping inform what we're learning from animal models and translating them to humans. Um, but this, this work is really important because it may help us better understand what leads to this sex difference in neuropsychiatric disorders um, that occur during this period of time. So um, in the real world, who knows? What does it really mean? I mean, I'm talking about vocabulary scores. Um, but I, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence. And you can see here the sex difference in car accidents as well as changes in the brain. So this work was done with so many people in my lab. And this was um, the day that the space shuttle flew over Los Angeles. And we were all standing on the roof of the um, parking structure at Children's Hospital. And we got to see the space shuttle fly right over our heads. That's it. easy one. one. Mm -hmm. How the testosterone levels stable if they change? Much, I mean, it, it, it's complicated. Uh, she asked if testosterone levels were stable or is it like cortisol where it varies throughout the day? And the answer is yes. Um, it, it varies, but not nearly as much as cortisol. So it, it's a big question. With estradiol in girls, you have to think about what stage in their menstrual cycle. But it's one of those things where it's better to at least try your best to start figuring it out, because it's not a perfect world. You know, we're, we're trying to do some of these in our fetal alcohol studies, looking at hormones. And I just realized when you're dealing with humans, you cannot test every child at the exact same time. You kind of, but I know when Ron was, collecting the data, they did their best to standardize it to some extent. Maybe he could answer that better, but.
it's not just an issue of timing. Mm -hmm. There are like qualitative changes that result in maturity, you know, once you mature. And I think you, you talked a little bit about it in the sense that perhaps females might have an early chance to integrate maybe emotional cognitive circuits. And then at the end you end up with things that are kind of different. Do you have an insight as to what are those Well, I mean, I just think we'd have to look at the, you know, the cognitive, behavioral, emotional literature. I mean, we still, at the end of the day, have the same sex difference in types of disorders, right? I mean, males are more, women are still more likely to be depressed than men, and men are still more likely to be psychopaths than women, right? So we still, wherever we end up, but I mean, you know, one of my favorite examples to use of this is like, it, it all happens in an environment, right? I mean, everything going on out here is helping wire what's going on in here, even during adolescence and in childhood. And my favorite example about that is thinking about kids with dyslexia. So it's not just something's different about their brain that makes it hard for them to read, right? It's over those 10 years where kids who don't have this problem are actually reading and wiring up their brains, right? And the kids who aren't doing it because it's hard for them, you know, don't have that same advantage. So the same thing, it could be that girls are developing this earlier sort of top-down control when they haven't had, again, this is just an, an idea. They haven't had the experience. So it's not static, right? But to some extent, when it comes to psychopathology anyway, you still have that sex difference in, at the end. But where it started is what I'm thinking about, I think.